Father, thank you very much for this wonderful time, Lord. We are so curious to know what you want to reveal to us through your servant this evening. We ask for your special anointing upon him, Lord, so that we may be able to hear your voice. Lord, grant us the grace and the spirit to receive and perceive what he is teaching and it may be uh, fitted in our hearts and may help us in our spiritual work, O oh Lord. And the time we spend in discussion, Lord, may be a quality, uh, quality time that edifies each and everyone here. And Lord, through everything we do, your name be exalted. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And welcome again to our Wednesday evening Bible study. Today, I continue the series on uh, history of the church. Uh, and uh, as I was uh, reading uh, to prepare for this, uh, this session, uh, there were two things that uh, came to my mind. One was... Um, I was so horrified just reading about how uh, the so-called inquisition, as it has been recorded, has taken place that I was just wondering, how do I talk about these things, you know, with uh, the kind of gruesome brutality with which people were treated. And of course, now, as I kept re reading, some say that some of these things were exaggerated. So uh, we probably will never really know what happened uh, so many centuries back. But on the other hand, as I was reading, I also noticed that, uh, you know, when we talk about the Inquisition, the first institution that comes to mind is the Roman Catholic Church. But Inquisition is not just uh, limited to the Roman Catholic Church. There were others who were also uh, involved, maybe not as to the scale as uh, the Roman Catholic Church, which uh, institutionalized this whole Inquisition, uh, you know, uh, aspect, but I don't think anybody can stand uh, vindicated, you know, that they were more righteous than the others. So we are all uh, sinners together. And so um, uh, I wanted to then take a wider focus. And if you noticed, I don't know if you were able to see my, uh, my post in the group, I call it the history of discipline, correction, inquisition in the church. And my subtitle is, uh, Does the Church Have a Right to Discipline? So we'll hopefully get through all the material today and uh, see how we can do. Right. Let me then, as usual, get to my uh, PowerPoints because uh, it will just be helpful for us to gather the information through the PowerPoints. Uh, and uh, I'm presuming you can see my screen now. Right, so that was the poster in case you couldn't open it. <laughs> there it is. That was what I was uh, trying to communicate as we begin. All right, let's uh, uh, continue. False teachings and heresy. Now, what I wanted to mention was that uh, uh, our focus will narrow on the history of the church, um, even though false teachings and heresy uh, were prevalent from the beginning, from the, I should say, from the beginning of history. I mean, can you imagine in the Garden of Eden, we were introduced to false teaching and humanity went awry because of that. So there is false teaching that follows God's people, you know, right through, uh, right from the very beginning of history. But my focus will only be on the church. All right. So beginning with uh, with the early church, Heresies that included uh, Gnosticism. Uh, Gnosticism is, uh, you know, saying that the physical body was evil and hence Christ could not have a human body. There was adoptionism. That's another heresy which says that because Christ successfully resisted temptation of the devil, he was adopted as the son of God. He was not eternally the son of God. So that's another heresy. Docetism, I'm just giving you a brief on each one of these uh, docetism, uh, Jesus, his historicity and his bodily existence, uh, and above all, the human form of Jesus was merely a semblance, very similar to uh, uh, Gnosticism. Montanism is another heresy, 
taught that the Holy Spirit was continuing to give new revelation through Montanus, who was the, uh, the author of this particular heresy, and that Jesus would soon bring New Jerusalem to the place called Phrygia. So these are all, uh, you know, heretical teachings. Sabellianism some, is something that we have discussed in the past. The belief that uh, instead of three persons in the one being, uh, there are the, the three persons are actually three modes of the one being. In other words, the God, the one God wears three hats. So that is Sabellianism. Sabellianism. Arianism, of course, you know, the son of so the son was not eternal uh, or, or not of one nature with God. Pelagianism uh, denied original sin, that there is no need for God's intervening grace uh, and because people can make up their mind to be saved or not. So these were some of the heresies that plagued the church, uh, the church as such from the first century onwards. Now, how did the church deal with these heresies? and these false teachings. All right, so let's go to the next slide. Uh, in the first century church, now obviously we are, uh, we can very clearly see the many heretical teachings. The, it began right in the book of Acts uh, uh, with regards to the discussion on circumcision, the Mosaic law, uh, the so-called Judaizers. They wanted, uh, you know, that not only grace, but the keeping of the law was necessary. So that was one of the teachings that was, uh, uh, you know, um, that the Apostle Paul especially and Peter and the early church uh, people had to deal with. Paul, Apostle Paul talks about another Jesus, another Gospels. If you read the book of Galatians, that was very much there. Uh, that was another false teachings. Correction of moral behavior. If you remember Corinthians, how Paul was uh, had uh, instructed them to put a man out who was actually sleeping with his stepmother. All right. Now, what was the method of correction in the first century church, as we read it in the scriptures? Uh, the uh, the correction was, of course, bringing a conference together. You remember the Jerusalem conference where they discussed what were the problems in these. Uh, uh, in, in these kinds of situations. And then there were also warnings in the epistles, the apostle warns of false teachers and how it, they should be dealt with. Maybe sometime there was one-on-one -on -one corrections. If you remember Paul, the apostle had to accost Peter when he was going awry, when he was going uh, away from the pure teachings of the scriptures and being hypocritical, he had to do a one-on-one -on -one and which is, of, of course, recorded in the scriptures. And another thing that the first century church followed was the removal from fellowship. We would call it disfellowshipment or excommunication. Uh, uh, so these, this particular method was followed in the first century church. I want to also just follow up with uh, the book of Jude in terms of the first century church. You remember the epistle of Jude. Jude was the brother of James. Uh, he writes about heretical teachings, false teachings. I'm just reading from uh, his epistle. Godless men who change the grace of God into license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ for our only, uh, our only sovereign Lord. So these were, uh, you know, situations that needed correction. Jude also writes how they were polluting their own bodies, rejecting authority, slander celestial beings. Uh, and so he brings up, uh, you know, all of these against those who were teaching such kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, such kind of maybe doctrines or teachings. And how did Jude say that these must be contended with? Uh, he says, and this is the very famous statement that many of us uh, are familiar with, Contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to uh, the saints. In other words, the way these heresies and false teachings were dealt with was appealing to remain faithful to the teachings of the apostles and, of course, of Jesus Christ. I don't have it on the screen, but let me read you what else he says. He says in verse 20, epistle of Jude, but you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, 
keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. And in verse 22, he also goes on to say, be merciful to those who doubt, save others by snatching them from the fire, uh, to others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. So basically he's asking us to remain faithful, counter these teachings. Uh, if necessary, of course, we have seen excommunication was there, removal from the fellowship. So this was how we see heresy, false teachings being dealt in the early church. As things progressed, as the church began to develop, uh, you know, we move into the uh, first, uh, we move into the second and third century, and uh, false teachings continued to appear, and uh, the church had to keep on adjusting to these things, and then let's see what happens. Uh, they started developing something called the practice of penance. This is the way how they corrected heresy, her heretical teaching. Now, we, I must say that the practice of uh, excommunication continued, continued into the third century. But those who were excommunicated were condemned as heretics and banished, sometimes even from the kingdom, especially leaders were banished from the kingdom. But they were readmitted after they recanted their false opinions or false teachings. Uh, and so they had a practice of readmission only after what they call as a period of penance. And how would they administer that? Some of them said they have to be rebaptized. So the controversy of rebaptism, uh, some said no, some said yes. And that even exists today. <laughs> there are so many people who ask, should I be rebaptized because I was born in, you know, in some other fellowship and they don't believe that, you know, maybe they were born in a cult and should they be rebaptized? So this controversy continues to remain even today. And so this basically led to something called uh, the penitential system, right? Uh, so grave sins. Uh, such as adultery, fornication, murder, heresy, denying Christ in persecution, could be dealt with excommunication. And then after a period of penance, they would be allowed in. Uh, Tertullian, one of the church fathers, in the later half of the second century, was the first to introduce the distinction between moral, or so I should say mortal, and venial sins, which of course became a very big deal in the Roman Catholic Church. They were distinguishing between mortal and venial sins, right? Um, so in this, this practice of penitential system, in order to be forgiven and restored to the church, they had to confess publicly their sins, submit themselves to an extensive penitential uh, discipline of personal humiliation. So that was how, you know, heresy and false teachings were dealt with. Um, sometimes they were asked to go on long fasts, uh, undergo weeping, uh, and uh, some of them were asked to go through protracted ascetic and religious exercises for long periods of time. So they had to prove that they were, you know, really, uh, you know, uh, uh, recanting their false teachings. Uh, uh, now, somewhere, somewhere here, as the church developed these penitential systems, of course, uh, I must bring up one more thought on the screen here. Later, this this uh, penitential system was corrupted, so corrupted that the Roman Catholic, by the Roman Catholic Church leaders, it led to the Protestant Reformation. Of course, that was much, much later. But somewhere here, through as the church was developing these corrective systems, um, it began to turn violent, especially after ecclesiastical and secular leaders started joining hands. This penitential system and, of course, the correction started turning violent. And the first execution, you know, where somebody was, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
convicted of heresy and the first death penalty was passed on a person called Priscillian of Avila. He was a Spanish bishop. Uh, his, uh, this is three, 340, between 340 and 385 AD. So we are already in the fourth century. Priscillian, the bishop, taught that angels and humans emanated from the Godhead, that bodies were created by the devil, and that human souls were joined to, to bodies as a punishment for sins. These beliefs uh, led to a denial of the true humanity of Christ. And obviously, there was uh, influences from the Gnostic, the Manichaeanism, all of these things rolled into his her heresy. And he was convicted to death. And I think he was burnt at the stake for this. We then now move from the 4th, 5th century straight into the Inquisitions. And this was in the 12th and 13th century, which indeed began the era of the dreaded Inquisition, right? Which uh, uh, we'll spend a few moments on. Basically, Inquisitions refers to judgment of heresy by the Roman Catholic Church. They uh, coined this phrase with cooperation of secular authorities, always went together. The, ch the church would condemn and the secular authorities would carry out the punishment uh, or the torture or even the death penalty. So the what was the, uh, what do you call it? Uh, what was the, uh, the rationale behind all of this? The rationale was that any dissension from official teachings of the church endangered the health of society and public order. So they said that, um, uh, you know, a, a, these kind of teachings, heretical teachings, endangered society and public order, and the church had a right to correct that. And the secular authorities went with that because they said, you know, if these kinds of things were, uh, you know, they, they could cause division in the empire or in the kingdom, and they didn't want that to happen. So, Ecclesiastical and secular authorities got together and then continued uh, to inflict the inquisition on the people. And punishment or the infliction of pain, they believe was so that the body, uh, so that the soul could be saved. So the body had to be punished so that the soul could be saved. And that is how they justified the tremendous amount of torture that took place. So this is where the judgment of heresy became increasingly violent. So let's just look at the historical, uh, you know, uh, inquisition movements. Uh, uh, and there are specifically four, they talk about, four inquisition movements by various uh, uh, orders of the church as well as secular authorities. The first one was uh, the medieval inquisition, which started around 11, uh, 1184 AD. And who are the, uh, the uh, target? The targets were the Cathars and the Waldensians. The Cathars, one, once again, was a group of people who started a movement and they had some Gnostic beliefs and they actually broke away from the Roman Catholic Church and, st and, and started a separate church. And obviously they became targets for the Roman Catholic Church, right? The Waldensians were uh, condemned by the Catholic, or rather the Waldensians condemned the Catholic clergy as being unworthy of holding uh, religious office. They insisted on literal interpretation of the Bible and the right to read the Bible for oneself, right? So these people, Cathars and Waldensians, were hunted down and properties were ex uh, was confiscated and many of them executed, you know, sometimes on the spot. You know, the squads used to go and find them uh, and discover them and they had to keep hiding from place to place. And so this basically describes the medieval inquisition at the start of 1184. Uh, uh, AD. All right. We come then to the Spanish Inquisition. All right. That, and this was one of those very long ones and, of course, very brutal ones. Uh, Pope 
uh, Sixtus or the 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 fourth with secular you know with uh, in conjunction with secular powers uh, exercised authority over people uh, and uh, you know especially they targeted the converts from Judaism from Islam and even from the Greek Orthodox Church you know Christians from the Greek Orthodox. Uh, were targeted for uh, heresy uh, or for sliding back from their conversion. And many of them were forcibly converted by the, uh, the, you know, by the Spanish people. And especially the Spanish colonies and the Americas, where the, you know, the Spanish king and the, uh, uh, the Roman Catholic Church together targeted many, many, uh, you know, to the Inquisition. And uh, uh, according to some reports, millions of natives in the Americas were slaughtered in the name of religion, right? Um, so that was the Spanish Inquisition. Then you have the Portuguese Inquisition, started by uh, the king, of course, of Portugal, and the Pope cooperated. So uh, as the Portuguese began to, you know, um, uh, establish their power, and of course in their colonies, they they brought in the Inquisition. And I must mention of the Goan Inquisition, where Hindu converts and Jewish converts. Remember, some of the Jews came to settle in India, and uh, many of them on the western coast. And uh, the, when the Portuguese invaded and took over Goa and some of these people who were made to forcibly convert into Catholicism. And these people were targeted for the Inquisition. Um, and they tried to find those who were trying to practice their religion in secret, especially uh, Jews and Hindus. And many of them fled, as it says, to Ponda, which is, I'm presuming, is just outside of uh, the, uh, the Goa, where it became a temple town, where they settled uh, to practice their religion. Just to, just to uh, give you an inkling of the Goan Inquisition, I'm reading from somebody, uh, a, a, an author called T.R. D'Souza. He wrote about the Goan Inquisition and uh, the kind of uh, brutality that was subjected to those who were uh, convicted in the Inquisition. I am uh, quoting, it says, the screams of agony of the victims, men, women, and children could be heard in the streets in the stillness of the night as they were brutally interrogated, flogged, and slowly dismembered in front of their relatives. Eyelids were sliced off, extremities were amputated carefully. A person could remain conscious even though the only thing that remained was his torso and head. So I just give you an inkling, a sampling of the kind of brutality the Inquisition uh, inflicted upon these people. All right. So um, after this comes the Roman Inquisition. And, uh, and I, I just want to, you know, once again, I don't want to go into too much detail. Uh, 1542, Pope Paul III and the famous Galileo was silenced and imprisoned under this inquisition. So you have uh, all of these movements, you know, with the medieval, the Spanish, the Portuguese and the Roman inquisition. Now, like I was saying a little earlier, we think that, yes, this was in the Romans, uh, I mean, so the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, really uh, perfected the the institution of the Inquisition. But I dare say that it was just, uh, you know, uh, confined to just Catholicism. It's very unfortunate, unfortunate to know there was also an Inquisition under the Protestants. So I'll just give you a, 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 just a few thoughts on the Inquisition under the Protestants. Especially in Germany and Scotland, many were accused of witchcraft and burnt at the stake, right? 
uh, and uh, apparently 40,000 deaths, mostly burning at the stake, was listed between 1560 and 1630 in these countries, Germany, Scotland, where Protestantism is in, uh, was uh, very much uh, extant. Um, Michael, I just want to give you the instance of Michael Servetus, uh, a Spanish physician, uh, and you'd be interested to know who was behind his uh, burning at the stake. Michael Servetus, a Spanish physician, argued that the union of church and state after Constantine was a great apostasy. And of course, he went against the doctrine of the Trinity. He said the doctrine of the Trinity offended God. And so he was convicted under the uh, Inquisition. And the one who was instrumental in bringing an accusation against him was none other than John Calvin, the great Protestant reformer after Martin Luther. John Calvin prepared a list of 38 accusations against Michael Servetus. Calvin argued that he be beheaded, but, and, but you know, the secular authorities decided to burn him at the stake. And I'm reading this from the story of Christianity written by Gonzalez from page 67. So this is the unfortunate uh, situation that existed. You know, I wanted to just uh, mention, why is it that so many were burnt at the stake? And uh, I was just reading, uh, and I, let me just quote for you, the, the reason why they chose burning at the stake as one of the principal ways of uh, executing somebody uh, under the, uh, you know, guilty under the Inquisition. Uh, it says, the Qatars were heretics. As such, they had to be burnt. The smallest trace of sin had to be extirpated. In other words, sin is extirpated or, 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 or removed only by burning. Right? And so they, they decided to burn them. The corrupt body or sinful body had to be destroyed and evil exorcised in the flames. Now, can you imagine, it goes on to say, even corpses were disinterred, in other words, they were exhumed from the grave, and burnt if the deceased was suspected to have been a heretic. And why? Because these people believed in the resurrection of the body, and they were even, they thought they would deny them the resurrection of the body by burning them because the body, then the body would be completely exhumed. Right. So, um, so most of them were burnt at the stake. And I was just looking at the ways that they uh, inflicted, uh, what do you say, uh, the, uh, the torture under the Inquisition. And they were so brutal that I decided to leave them out. If you have uh, any stomach for it, you may go onto the net and see the kind of brutality. Apparently that was, uh, you know, uh, perpetrated on those who were uh, uh, sentenced. Let me just finish this slide and I'll go to the next one. England, many persecuted for religious reasons, between 1508 and 1689, especially when the Reformation took place in England, when the Anglican Church came to being, they separated from the Roman Catholic Church, and many of them uh, were, uh, you know, uh, subjected to persecution. And that's how you have the Puritans who migrated to the America, to the North American continent, to escape persecution. All right. Okay. Now, that was Protestants. What about the... Eastern Orthodox Church. Well, I have a quotation uh, about the Eastern Orthodox Church, which uh, which basically will help us understand uh, with regards to what happened with regards to the Eastern Orthodox Church. Here it says, the Inquisition is not alien to the Orthodox Church. 
it just was never as organized and not as much documentation survives for, from most of the Roman Empire in the East. The Roman Catholic Inquisition is in the popular imagination. And of course, the author goes on to say that they unnecessarily burn, uh, blame the Roman Catholic Church when even the Eastern Orthodox, as well as the Protestants, were uh, involved in the, you know, in the movement called the Inquisition. Okay, that is basically what I wanted to bring about. Let me just uh, move towards concluding this session by mentioning how the church began to realize that uh, the these inquisition movements were um, a terrible blotch on the church. And it was Pope John Paul II who went to the extent of recognizing this uh, and actually tendered an apology. Let me bring that thing out. In 2001, Pope John Paul II said the following. He said, we are asking pardon for the divisions among Christians, for the use of violence that some have committed in the service of truth, and for attitudes of mistrust and hostility assumed toward followers of other religions. Pope John Paul II was issuing a blanket apology for all the atrocities, not just the Inquisition, but the various violent ways the church dealt with people of other religions also, sometimes, many a times, forcible conversions also. And in fact, in his tenure, Pope John Paul's tenure, in preparation for the Jubilee year in 2000, the Vatican, it says, opened the archives of the Holy Office uh, to a team of 30 scholars from around the world. According to the Governor General of the Order of the Holy Sepulchre, recent studies seem to indicate, after the uh, this uh, office was opened, seem to indicate that torture and the death penalty were not applied with the pitiless rigor often ascribed to the Inquisition. In other words, some of these historical records may have been exaggerated according to these records. But nevertheless, they don't deny the fact that the Inquisition took place and uh, violence was perpetrated. Uh, and uh, the church has a lot to apologize for. Now, I have one more slide to go. But before that, I want to just stop sharing for just a moment. And uh, I just wanted to get your thoughts on uh, what you think of the violence that was being perpetrated by the church. When I say the church, all of them put together. And I think we definitely the Roman Catholic Church, but even the Protestant Church, you know, uh, Protestant leaders acquiesced to an, inquisi an inquisition which many times turned violent. And uh, some people tend to use Old Testament scriptures to justify violence. And the way Israel was, uh, you know, asked to deal with uh, those who were non-Israelite. Even though there are so many, so much in the scripture of dealing kindly with non-Israelites, but they pick and choose scriptures like how God ordered, you know, the elimination of the Canaanites and all of those people so that they could occupy the land. And also uh, the uh, example of, uh, uh, you know, you remember, I can't get the name now, uh, the man who, uh, you know, sent a spear, a stake through the head of two people uh, who were, you know, fornicating. And they use such examples to to justify violence against heresy. So, Caleb, Caleb, Caleb is name. Caleb. Uh, Praveen, could you just uh, do the needful thank you? Uh, so, uh, let me just open it up for some thoughts from you, and then I want to go 
to um, the GCI policy on discipline. But before that, does the church have a right to discipline? And is this the way to do discipline? Uh, what do you think? You've seen how from the very first century there was discipline. But uh, give me some thoughts of how you think discipline should be administered. Can we use Old Testament scriptures to justify the kind of things that was done? Anil, I think you want to say something. Go ahead. Not yet. <laughs> no. Yeah. Just to help you start off, <laughs> uh, can we use Old Testament scripture where God says, go and uh, eliminate the land of the Canaanites? Can we do that? Because that seemed to be something that uh, people say, especially when, you know, the colonizers went and they started killing the natives and they thought that they can go and take over these lands. How do you, how do you, how do you look at those? Go ahead, Praveen, go ahead. Um, perhaps uh, there are a few things we have to consider as we are uh, dealing with this particular uh, subject. Um, before we are going to, to talk about discipline as well as inquisition, uh, we should be uh, understanding the difference, uh, sorry, especially what, what Christian faith is. Uh, whether Christian faith is limited to person, it's a personal practice only, or it is a a social practice. These difference have to be made because especially in the postmodern world, uh, religion and faith has become a personal uh, personal thing. It is not related to a group or it is not related to uh, any society. In all these uh, inquisition stories, we can see the faith has become a public, uh, uh, public practice as well as a uh, uh, the moment the politics joined uh, the public practice of religion, uh, what happened, it brought all the distra uh, distortions uh, into the practice. One among them is uh, uh, this inquisition. And especially you asked the question about, can we take the example of the Old Testament uh, uh, scripture? That, that That is actually a very complicated thing, I feel, because... Uh, uh, in the Old Testament, especially if you read uh, the Old Testament scripture and the history of Israel, the religion and the politics are so uh, interconnected, they cannot be separated. And in fact, at least modern day, we have, uh, we are calling something called state, something called uh, church and religion. But when it uh, when we read the history of Israel, we cannot find any difference between church and religion. Uh, the church played, uh, church in the sense, the religion of Judaism, uh, it played a very uh, important role in governance uh, of the entire nation. So these were always uh, what we call, uh, people were misusing the power in one or other, like uh, kings tried to misuse the power of the church or church tried to misuse the power of the kings. So that was very evident, very strong uh, to if you to see in the Old Testament. So definitely Old Testament uh, is not a proper example for us to uh, discuss about this particular thing. But New Testament gives beautiful picture, uh, you know, uh, and it, it, it this does not separate again church and religion. It, is, it keeps the church and religion together. But Jesus brings another dimension into uh, this uh, connection and relationship between the church and uh, uh, the state, where we, we, which we are calling theocracy, the kingdom of God, and which is going to be uh, executed and which is going to be established in a different level. This is not uh, uh, the typical uh, history of Israel where we can take their practices where church and uh, uh, people, the kingdom of the people were together and brought the violence. But in the New Testament, the kingdom of God has come. It is of love. It is of joy and peace and happiness. So the kingdom of God, the theocracy where religion and uh, 
uh, state and religion they are, they are going to come together but they are going to deal differently uh, as uh, the examples also were given uh, in the bible itself like especially corinthians uh, first corinthians we can talk about jesus uh, sorry apostle paul was writing about disciplining a person who was into uh, sin uh, and definitely no places uh, the church executed this power to punish others at the same but uh, the moment the church joined the state from uh, uh, this fourth century onwards uh, the state was influencing the church more and they started uh, uh, misusing the power everything we could see so what i would like to say is as we are going to talk about this particular subject uh, we need to make uh, understand we need to understand the state and the church should be distinct and uh, but uh, no no place these two can uh, interfere in any any of their uh, um, uh, what we'll call any of their um, responsibilities we call thing any of the things i guess uh, interfere in any of those but uh, the church should always look unto god not state for power church should look unto god for discipline or exercising power not at uh, any political party uh, so that's where we we should be inclined to but unfortunately even in the modern day the church is still looking unto uh, the political power and try to uh, bring persecution into this world those days it was different even modern day america also we can see uh, how the church is trying to influence the society influence uh, the society not by the values of theocracy where love and peace and joy but through politics so that is not a Christian way of influencing the society. So we should maintain the distinction between personal faith and public faith. And the public faith should be looking unto Jesus. Uh, personal faith, anyway, it, it, it is left for a person. So what happens is the public faith, when we look unto Jesus, we value how Jesus values people personally. So when we practice Christianity as a public religion, we should look unto Jesus. That helps us to treat our brothers uh, pro properly and uh, uh, and deal with them as Jesus does. Well said. I think uh, yeah, the, the, the pollution that happens between when the church and state mixes together uh, is very, very unfortunate and of course led to so many abuses. This is a total abuse of uh, the, the the of you know yeah, yeah, yeah. Of yes yes Anil had a thought Anil go ahead no yeah uh, what Praveen uh, explained nicely but but that still doesn't explain the question you asked why did God uh... hold on yeah <laughs> all right Anil is uh probably moving places. Uh, in the meantime, anybody else have any thoughts? Uh, yeah, we'll let Anil, uh, yeah, Franklin, go ahead. Anil will settle down and then we'll get to you. Franklin, can you mute, unmute yourself? No, I can't hear you. Now, sir? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Uh, sir, uh, Praveen, sir, made a good distinction between uh, the role of state and the role of the church. But uh, uh, unfortunately, so the Protestant Inquisition uh, did not draw this distinction, sir. Okay, I can understand, sir, the Protestant Inquisition where 40,000 people were executed uh, on the grounds of not believing in Trinity. But uh, what is this problem, sir, state and church? They did not draw a distinction. Uh, you're, you're saying that uh, even the Protestants' uh, leadership got entangled with uh, the, the secular leaders? Is that what you're saying? Exactly, exactly, sir. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, which is correct. Yes, actually, some of the kings in Germany and all of those, they all exercised power over the bishops and all of them. And then, and un unfortunately, they were also hand in, hand in glove. Maybe not to the extent of the Roman Catholic Church, but then there was some corruption there. You had another question, uh, Franklin? Or? No, sir. But uh, sir, uh, Pope, uh, Pope John Paul II was a gem, sir. Outstanding person. <laughs> How did he have such broad outlook, sir? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, in one sense, he couldn't escape the, you know, the taint on the church. Like, for example, what's happening today with all the sexual sin that's coming out. Uh, you can't ex you can't justify that anymore. 
you know you can't hide it anymore so uh, we are living in a world where all of these things one day have to become or else what do you do of course he had the courage to say you know we apologize which is uh, which is which is good yeah this intellectual honesty and an academic integrity uh, he knew the the role of the church you know the church Hopefully. was responsible i think right. he's admitting the, uh, the 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 heinous crimes done done by church you know, he did yes he he accepts that even the role they played in the world war 2 and the massacre of the jews uh, yeah. it's very unfortunate yes yeah. hats off to him hats off to right. pope john paul uh, pope right. john paul too right anil you had a thought well now that you mentioned john paul too <laughs> he also had a lot of uh, issues because he he suppressed quite a few reports of child abuse made by his own people to the, the like the jesuits one of the, the head of the jesuits was abusing and they reported it john paul just ignored it didn't do anything so good and bad that's fine now i was coming to that earlier question that you had asked that how do we explain god uh, ask, uh, asking israelites to just annihilate annihilate the uh, canaanites you know kill them or what one answer that i hear is oh they were sinful they were you know sacrificing babies and stuff like that and so they had to be sort of decimated um i don't know whether that that answers the whole question or i don't know i'd like to hear what you have to say uh let me see what i can say i don't know if praveen has a thought on that but uh, uh, you know this is a nagging question and uh, this is a huge question especially atheists bring these things up and say how can you worship a yes. god who uh, you know orders these kinds of executions uh I I have not resolved that yet properly. I have my own thoughts on it, but I'm still revising it. But I can say one thing. That was uh, commanded by God at a particular time, at a particular place. It was not to be carried over into generations to come. It was for a particular time, for a particular place. In other words, it was uh, a limited, you know, judgment that was done. so we cannot use that as an excuse today to say that you know this land belongs to me and so i'm going to kill everybody who doesn't belong to this land you know and that is that is unfortunate which unfortunately the church <laughs> altered on they went to the you know so called discovered new lands and then they just massacred the people there that's very unfortunate but uh, we'll come back to this question i mean this is a big question as to why uh, you know so many of them were massacred uh, well that's a big question any other thoughts on uh, i mean uh, maybe i should also ask does the church have a right to discipline of course uh, i think praveen answered that to some extent we do it in love we understand what a human being is we understand right. a brother and sister in christ is but does the church have a right to discipline any thoughts on that i think the church does have a right okay <laughs> right <laughs> okay but in a merciful way but as you said in love and i mean in a spirit of correction and not condemning and so on okay <clears throat> praveen you had a thought uh yeah i also believe that church does have a, a right to uh you know discipline discipline is the right word uh, we can use um uh, at the same time um uh, the practice how how the church should execute discipline also explained in the scripture like uh, you know we should go and talk to the person if not then we need to bring uh, it's it should not be one man's decision uh in the church to execute uh any uh, discipline kind of things and all uh so church does have a right to uh, discipline with the scripture with love it has to be seasoned with love always and it should be a good practice uh, where we can do together but it should not be again majoritarianism uh, that also <laughs> we have to be uh, careful and uh, one of the big big thing 
i personally feel uh, we we also need to consider that uh, you know we talk about so many serious things where we talk about uh, where we say about discipline of the church and all but at minute small small things where church is judging people that's where also we should be uh, careful that is not uh, discipline actually that is condemnation kind of things we if any person just fallen into sin or into just uh, uh, failed in one or two, some more um, uh, moral practices and all or uh, some kind of rumors we hear in the church we start judging them and we start uh, setting ourselves away from them those are some serious things actually and uh, when we talk about these disciplines uh, we need to be sensible about those small matters also where we should act more like jesus uh, you know one of the songs from ca casting crowns where it says uh, uh, you know Jesus, make my heart to cry for what you cry for. You know that's how that that attitude we should be having, uh, rather than uh, you know. Where in in other words, G when Jesus himself said, "Judge not, lest to be judged." Uh, he himself was not judging. He said, "I am not going to judge the woman caught in adultery." And as a church, we should not be judging them. We should take the perspective of judgment, which is from the scripture, which is restoration. Every discipline, every judgment the church does, is it should be focused and the goal should be restoration. If the goal is to keep ourselves right or keep ourselves pure or uh, condemn the other person who have done wrong, then we have totally missed the gospel. If our focus and our goal is to restore the person, not to keep our, uh, our uh, purity also, that that helps uh, and uh, helps us to beat along with the heart of Jesus. Yes, I think well said, and uh, I must say that it's very unfortunate that we have our own our own inquisitions, <laughs> personal inquisitions in the church, and that becomes uh, you know very unhealthy. And uh, you know, since we are talking so much about healthy church. Uh, these are things that uh, we will continue to consider and uh, bring the right attitude towards it. Let me just uh, bring you, a, a, you know, a GCI policy on discipline. Uh, and, uh, you know, and then we can end with this. I'll go back to my screen share at this time. Um, okay. Uh, this is uh, a, a bit of a long paragraph, but uh, I'll just put it on there. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see it, but I'll read it for you so that you are able to then uh, follow. It says, GCI's denominational leaders and local church pastors have the responsibility to offer such compassionate warnings when false teachings arise within their spheres of responsibility. In giving these warnings, we do not condemn, but hold out in trust the testimony concerning what we have come to believe as a witness for them to consider. In situations where church discipline is called for, it will be exercised in hope, trusting they will someday, if not now, come to see that what we affirm as true to Christian faith and practice is a faithful witness to the God revealed in Jesus Christ according to scripture. In all cases, we trust that God is at work to bring all to spiritual maturity, to the unity of the faith, and so we do our part to assist in that process. And this is, I am reading from the articles written by Gary Dedo, Church and its Ministry. Uh, so you will probably see that uh, we do have a responsibility. Local leadership has a responsibility if false teachings are being, you know, are being circulated and people are being led astray away from the scriptures, obviously we can't turn a blind eye to that. But how do we do it? We do it, you know, in the way it's described, uh, with that sense of uh, love and compassion, uh, without condemnation, because ultimately, you know, they answer to God, and uh, hoping for that redemption, restoration. Uh, so that we can retain the unity in the faith. 
and we constantly, especially now, talk about you know the uh, the core matters of Christian faith, uh, and not so very much be picky on the small things where we can allow diversity. Uh, we don't have to have uniformity in every aspect of you know church life and faith, but in the core matters we cannot obviously uh, slide. Yes. Uh, it's unfortunate, but uh, discipline is something that, uh, you know, uh, a church has to consider. We cannot ignore it. And we know prophetically how the Bible speaks of false teachers, many of them coming in, especially so-called the so-called last days, the apostle Peter and Jude and uh, Paul, all of them warn of false teachers. And this day and age, we've got so many false teachings going around. And I keep, uh, you know, getting, I'm, I'm surprised with the amount of, uh, you know, false theologies that is being peddled. Uh, and I suppose one must be careful. And I think as shepherds in the church, we have a responsibility to protect the sheep. So we have to exercise some kind of discipline when it is becomes necessary. All right. Yes, Franklin. Sir, one last question, sir. Sir, that uh, controversy regarding uh, old earth creation and new earth creation, uh, does it fall within the ambit of uh, uh, heresy, sir? Uh, you're talking about uh, the uh, old earth, new earth, uh, you know, book. Yeah. That the earth is only 6,000 yeah. years old, not billions of years uh, yes, old. Does it fall in the category of heresy? Uh, in my understanding, no. Because uh, the Bible does not give a clear answer on that. It does not give you the date when the earth was created. Yeah. So nobody can say that they have the final word on it. So what we believe is that we leave that to, uh, you know, uh, Jesus Christ to answer in the kingdom. <laughs> so we don't have to worry about it. But both groups are passionate, sir, and they're at war at each other. Yeah, that is the unfortunate thing. You know, that is where Praveen was saying, you know, we, we, we make judgments on matters that, uh, you know, disputable matters, I think, is what the Apostle Paul says. Uh, and we don't have to do that, you know. We, we just let them believe, uh, you know. When it comes to that kind of belief, not the core beliefs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, if, anybody, if nobody has any thoughts, I think we have passed the time, basically. Anil, could you do us the honors? Thank you. Let's pray. <clears throat> oh, great God Almighty, Father, we come before you thanking you for your wonderful mercies and for your tremendous blessings upon us all. Lord. Almighty God, help us in these particular times to keep our focus right, Lord. Help us, Lord, to be focused on Jesus Christ, our Savior. <clears throat> be focused on his leadership as the Holy Spirit guides us, Lord. Oh, God Almighty, Again, help us, particularly in this time where, Lord, truth is being uh, sold as false and false as truth. We need to really focus on the gospel and keep our purpose firm and put our trust in our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity where we can all meet and, and study and praise you and fellowship, Father. May this continue to be so, Lord. Bless our meetings and bless those who are unable to attend, God. And we do pray, look after, provide for, and protect your people the world over. Thank you, Lord. We pray and ask all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.